Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. I am your host. I am Jill Escher, president of NCSA. And uh, you may have noticed that our last three episodes were focused on the issue of electromagnetic therapy, um, electro, I'm sorry, electroconvulsive therapy um, in autism. Uh, and that was really you know, focused on the issue of treatment. And today we're gonna kind of go into a, a slightly different direction, but also within the realm of science and research. And we are so incredibly fortunate to have one of the great minds of autism, an absolute encyclopedic genius on the topic with us today. And hopefully for two episodes, I anticipate this will be a two-part series. Uh, we have today with us Dr. Manuel Casanova. Hello, Dr. Casanova. Hello. He is coming to us from the state of South Carolina um, and uh, where he recently retired as a professor. Now, Dr. Casanova is one of these rare birds in the autism world where he, although he's a neuroscientist, neuroanatomist, um, he has interest in everything, right? He's interested in diagnosis. He's interested in causes. He's interested in genetics. Of course, uh, neurobiology, behavior, comorbidities, treatments. Um, he's interested in international issues around autism, and he's interested in social and political issues as well, including the controversial topic of neurodiversity that he, he's wrote about um, on many occasions. He uh, was born in Puerto Rico. He got his medical training here in the States at Johns Hopkins. He has been um, a, a, a neuropathologist. He's worked as a medical examiner. Um, he is well known for his work in imaging and his work on anatomy using post-mortem brains. Some of his really breakthrough work was on that. Um, he's also, uh, he, and he worked, he was a professor at the University of Louisville and then University of South Carolina. Um, he's also a prolific writer. I don't think he can stop writing. Every time I talk to him, he's telling me he's writing a new book. <laughs> and um, for example, I mean, this is like, look at this, uh, autism <laughs> updated. It's just massive. It's just, as I, I say, encyclopedic knowledge. I'm not kidding. Also, the history, the amount of history he knows and, um, you know, every little nuance in the research he seems to know. Here's another book he wrote with his wife, Emily Casanova. Um, so uh, you can see that, uh, and, and the list goes on. I don't have all of his books, but, you know, if, if you go online, you can see. How many do you have you written, do you think, Dr. Casanova? Um, 18 and one more to come. <laughs> okay, so we're heading towards 20. All right, I, I, that's enough of me rambling with my, my introduction, but I um, hope you can understand how fortunate we are to have him with us today. So um, I want to start off and um, really talk about your main research focus, which has been the brain. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is an area that people in the autism community don't have a really good grasp of, right? We have um, people, you know, on the neurodiversity side saying, oh, you know, autism is just, you know, a different way of thinking, a different cognition. And then you have people who have actually done the research and there are many, many, many papers finding pathology, not just difference, right? But pathology in autism brains. Now autism brains aren't just different, but they function so differently that they lead to abnormal cognition and behavior. Mm -hmm. So sorry about that long intro. Let's talk about the brain. Let's dive into it. How is the autism brain different? Okay, well, Jill, uh, thank you for having me here and that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, in regards to autism and uh, findings of the brain, I can tell you that there are many, and the commonality among them is that it shows that uh, autism uh, may be caused by defects that happen very early on during brain development. And uh, uh, those uh, differences and abnormalities actually 
give rise to malformations that can be seen by either postmortem studies or by neuroimaging. Uh, by neuroimaging, we know that uh, the size of the brain, um, uh, the width of the uh, uh, cerebral cortex, the surface area, uh, the amount of gyrification, they are all different than from uh, neurotypical individuals. In regards to uh, postmortem studies, um, we know that uh, there are abnormalities in terms of uh, uh, cell division and migration, and you can see malpositioned neurons either alone or in groups in, in nuclei in and around the ventricles, the core of the brain, or that they have stopped in terms of their migration within the white matter or they have stopped within the boundary of the gray white matter junction. So um, let's stop oh, for a second because I, a lot of our listeners yes. don't have background in, in neuroscience and some of this might be a little mm -hmm. bit daunting for them. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to put this into layperson's language. When mm -hmm. the brain is developing, what ha how the brain develops through a process of neural migration. So mm -hmm. these neurons are born <laughs> right in this kind of part of the what, de developing brain. And then they, they move out, they just go, mm -hmm. and they are supposed to go to certain locations, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is these neurons, when they're, after they're born, they aren't moving and grooving right to the right locations in the cortex. Um, is that what you're saying? Yes, and um, it, it's very peculiar because you can draw inferences uh, by the findings. Uh, there are different migratory routes. Uh, one of them is radial, coming from the very center of the brain and going towards the cerebral cortex. And uh, that route of migration actually gives rise to pyramidal cells, a type of neuron that is primarily excitatory. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to presume that that's really abnormal. And many of the different uh, grouping of neurons that you see within the white matter, for example, are all composed of very large cells that were presumed to mature towards pyramidal cells, excitatory cells, but none of the smaller ones that are really inhibitory. And, and because you have a foci of excitatory cells without any inhibition, those actually um, provide for seizures, which in many cases are refractory. And uh, that's one of the major problems in regards to autism, which is seizures. And we can talk about that uh, later in terms of the pathology. There's right. another route. So, of so you're just, you're saying that the manifestation of seizures, in at least in some cases, might relate to the fact that these inhibitory cells don't properly develop. Definitely. If, yeah. Okay. And, and and for people who don't know, like there there are excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, and I'm I'm no neuroscientist, but mm -hmm. they have to have the right balance for proper brain functioning, and mm -hmm. this imbalance has been found frequently in autism research. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what is more in terms of uh, pathology, um, you know, there's another route of migration that is completely done by inhibitory cells. It, it's like a tangential migration to the uh, cerebral cortex. And uh, some of those cells appear to be reduced in, norm, uh, in number, uh, substantially so. Depending on region of the brain, uh, the interneurons or inhibitory cells are reduced by 40 to 60 percent. Wow. And, and it's a particular type of inhibitory cell that appears to be affected. Whenever you try to label those cells, uh, it's a particular subgroup which is called parvalbumin binding cells, okay? Parvalbumin you really, binding cells, okay. You, you, you really don't need to know the name, but this is extremely important because of many of the animal models, many of the syndromic types of autism, uh, genetic types of autism, they all have this as a commonality that many times this type of cell is reducing number. 
Okay, now having a reduced number of inhibitory cells immediately uh, gives you the supposition that they account for seizure problems within the brain. But it's so much more important than that because this type of cells are really fast spiking. They, they actually fire fast and uh, they provide for very fast brain waves. Okay, you, you know, the language of the universe is frequencies. And the way that the brain communicates uh, within a given region of the brain or between different regions of the brain is by frequencies. Now, uh, you can capture those frequencies in terms of the EEG, the electroencephalogram, and uh, you will see that there are different bandwidth of frequencies, some that are very fast, some that are very slow. When they are very slow, you're probably sleeping, okay? Yeah. When they are very fast, uh, extremely fast, you, you are probably engaged in a very sophisticated cognitive uh, process, uh, yeah. maybe trying to pursue some type of higher cognitive function, uh, theory of mind, joint attention, uh, things of the sort. Well, these inhibitory cells are the ones that function to generate those fast rhythm that help you uh, generate the necessary bandwidth and frequency for the higher cognitive functions. Okay. So one abnormality alone in terms of inhibitory cells explains a lot, okay? It explains not only um, a failure in terms of the homeostasis, excitatory inhibitory homeostasis of the brain, okay? But it also, uh, explains uh, the inability of the brain to communicate within itself with the very fast frequency waves and also to be able to support higher cognitive functions. Um, I, I, maybe if we have time, can I give you an example that maybe... Sure, let me ask a question though. So clinically in um, patients with autism, do you see an absence of those higher frequency waves? Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily an absence, mm -hmm. okay? You have abnormalities in that particular bandwidth. Okay. And um, I, I only say that because it's actually very difficult to record them and they're usually abnormalities and artifacts that if you are not careful, you may misread uh, the EEG. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, this, these high frequencies have to do with something that is called the binding phenomenon in, in terms of neurosciences. It has to do with the coherence. In, in terms of signals between different brain regions. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I had a, a friend and a mentor who used to explain it by saying, imagine that you have an insect in a field, okay? It may be a cricket, okay? And that cricket is chirping away because um, he, he's making a love song. He, he would like to find a mate. Okay. okay, all of a sudden, another cricket, um, maybe an acre away, hears the chirping, and they get together and they met, mate, and, and it's a happy love story. But, but you know, if, if that cricket is not alone, but it's with uh, 1,000 other crickets, and they are all chirping on their own, uh, that susceptible uh, cricket one acre away, we're here a mess. Won't be able to distinguish one cricket sound from another. Mm. Uh, there's too much noise coming mm. to uh, its sensory processing. Interesting, activity. interesting, so, okay. So the only way that cricket one acre away ca can actually make sense of the love song is if all of the crickets have a choral arrangement, if all of them chirp together, if all of them carry forth the same song. And, and, and the way the brain communicates one area with another area of the brain 
is, is because uh, they are chirping together at the same frequency, okay, mm. quote unquote. So if, if this brain region is working at 40 hertz, 40 cycles per second, this one 40 cycles per second, this one 40 cycles per second, they are working together, okay, in the same uh, process, mm. okay? okay? They are trying to do work together. In terms of autism, that's a major abnormality of the brain. Those high frequencies are not working together. Together, okay. Okay, and and that's a quality that that's a function of these cells that tend to be reduced in number, in in the brains of autistic individuals and also in animal models of autism and also in genetic uh, conditions uh, that give rise to autistic mm -hmm. symptomatology. And I only say that because it, it's a potential target for treatment sometime in in the future. Right. Oh, yeah. Because you're you're relating the underlying biology to mm -hmm. a possible treatment. Right now, that doesn't happen. <laughs> really, mm -hmm. it would be nice to to get there. Um, mm -hmm. So let, let's go to the topic of mini columns. You are mm -hmm. well known in the field for mm -hmm. um, your discoveries um, in the mini columns in the cortex. Can you explain what those are and, and why they're abnormal in autism? Yeah. Uh, mini column is a self-contained ecosystem of, of cells and their connections uh, that work together in, in terms of uh, providing functionality. And, and it's in the sense that uh, many people uh, believe in the cellular, theory of, of, of the organism that uh, the liver, the kidney, they all have a particular cell that in terms of their holistic properties, it represents the function of the organ as a whole. Well, many people believe that the neuron within the brain was that cell that represented the holistic properties of the brain as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, afferent, uh, central processing unit and then efferent components. And, and, and I have to believe that they were completely wrong, mm -hmm. okay? That there's a lot of variability uh, within neurons. So whatever you see in pictures of the brain is not necessarily the case. There is no one representative neuron, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of variability. Uh, what is representative of the brain? How many? Is, uh, let this back up because remember our our audience they probably have an eighth grade knowledge of you know <laughs> neurobiology. So, uh, how many different cell types are in the brain? Oh, many. Uh, I I would say that uh, in terms of uh, interneurons, if, even though we we uh, actually limit them to like uh, three different groups by. Um, uh, immunocytochemistry, uh, which would have at least 50 different types. But again, th there's a lot of variability, mm -hmm. okay, that you would have to account for. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to go, go, well, go back to your. Well, uh, I, I, I would like to make then another analogy for the listening public. Okay. okay. Uh, usually, in terms of technology, the brain was usually compared to the latest available technology. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at one po point, the brain was compared to um, hydraulic pumps, okay? Pumping water and information from one side to another. Hmm. Um, uh, more recently, because of electronics, we compared the brain to computers. But you know, um, the important thing is that the brain is not a digital computer, okay? It's, it's not a, a very high efficient unit with um, a semiconductor and logic chips um, working on a yes or no, zero or one mm -hmm. stimuli. It, it's more like the old analog computers of the 1960s. You know, when you enter a, a room in the 1960s with a computer, the computer filled the whole room. Mm -hmm. It was very hot because 
the computer was energy inefficient and you hear a lot of noise okay and and the noise was because of the relays that there were was a lot of cable work and and that is just to say that the intelligence of the analog computers was primarily in terms of the circuitry mm. okay the way that you connected cables in an analog computer was the way that you programmed it in terms of solving a mathematical problem or, mm. or any particular problem. And, and that's the way mini columns actually connect and they have weak linkages so they can reduce their linkages fairly easily. Okay, they, they respond to environmental challenges and they change their linkages. And, and the way that they link to each other is the way that you provide information transfer within the brain. So the mini columns are conglomerates of cells and their connections that give rise to functions. Um, I would like to say that uh, there's a particular uh, theory in, in terms of organization, which um, actually claims that uh, the sum of the total parts far exceeds their individual components, okay? Mm -hmm. Usually you have the emergence of functions by putting similar components together or components that were driven towards a particular function. You can have a car and that's made of a transmission system, a motor, a, a steering wheel, seats, but only when you put all of that together, you have a comfortable ride, mm -hmm. okay? So, so the, the thing is that with the mini columns, it's by putting and integrating the functions of, of the cells within mini columns and, and then their, their connectivity that you have the emergence of functions, okay? okay? That weren't there in terms of the individual neurons. And, and, and it's important because um, it's one of those structures that uh, even though it has some resilience, it can be easily damaged by migrational difficulties, which is what happens in autism. Mm -hmm. and, and what we found was that uh, many of the mini columns showed abnormalities in terms of their size and in terms of their compartmentalization, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I want to make it clear, um, when Dr. Casanova is talking about these studies on post-mortem brains, and that's what you were using, right, in your mini column mm -hmm. research, right? Um, mm -hmm. The postmortem brains come from brain donations. So maybe this is my public service announcement that I'm inserting here. But um, uh, if you want to further the science, if you have the very unfortunate circumstance where you can donate your mm -hmm. loved one's um, brain, um, that is definitely something to consider. So people like Dr. Casanova can make these important mm -hmm. discoveries. Okay, that was my aside back to Mindy Columns. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, the, the mini columns can be compartmentalized. And, and in the central core, you have the pyramidal cells that were the excitatory components. But surrounding them, you have the inhibitory cells that provided like a shower curtain of inhibition. They contain the signal within the core. Mm -hmm. and, and what we found was that this shower curtain that provided inhibition okay, that, that, that actually kept the stimuli within the core of the mini column, it was at fault, and that it was due by a lack of inhibitory cells, okay, mm -hmm. there, present there, and, and that has sort of been proven in, in um, other studies, primarily by uh, Veronica martinez Cerdeño. and uh, what happens is that you, you can imagine that a shower curtain actually keeps water inside of the bathtub. That's its basic function. Mm -hmm. if, if you didn't have the shower curtain, you would have water splashing all over the uh, bathroom floor. And, and without the shower curtain of inhibition of the mini columns, the stimuli 
are no longer kept within the mini columns, but they tend to splash, to suffuse into adjacent mini columns. And it creates like a cascade of excitation. Mm. Uh, the other thing is that it creates- And so how does, when you say that, like, how would that manifest behaviorally, right? We talked about seizures as one output mm. of mm. over excitation. But for something like this, would it result in just impaired communication across the brain and therefore deficits in learning and, um, you know, uh, sensory integration, et cetera? Uh, we could go to a whole interview on each <laughs> one of those. But, okay. Uh, let me give you um, an example. Um, uh, that sort of deficit could give rise to a phenomenon that has a fancy name. It's called stochastic resonance, okay? okay. And, and by that, what happens um, is, is that small stimuli that would usually be considered noise are able to fire up the system, okay? So behaviorally, uh, you could actually have uh, phenomenons of hyper or hyposensitivity being dictated by this phenomenon, okay? Um, uh, so so it, it's relevant in many different ways. It, it's not only epilepsy, it, it's, it's because um, it, it, the mini columns and their surround provide contrast to a signal so things do not get as diffused and otherwise you would have difficulties in making sense out of things, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, people that don't attribute uh, the necessary significance to perceptual objects around them uh, would know a little bit about this. Uh, uh, autistic individuals, for example, may see a face upside down or downside up and attach the same level of significance. You can relate and record emotional behaviors and autonomic responses when they are watching um, different uh, photographs of objects. Mm -hmm. And uh, they will react similarly to a face as to a house, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and and, and uh, then there are other phenomena. Uh, Temple Grandine, uh, in her books, she actually described how it was difficult for her to figure out or come to the conclusion that a Chihuahua and a Dalmatian dog, I'm not sure if she used those breeds, but mm -hmm. two different breeds of dogs were still dogs because for her, they were different animals. Mm -hmm. It all has to do with the same phenomenon. She couldn't okay. generalize. She couldn't words. generalize. I, actually, she was completely the opposite. She was completely concrete. Mm -hmm. and, and she suggested in her books, um, having a brain bag of photographs uh, mm -hmm. of a chimney or a hat or a hen to guide her in terms of uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. Okay, so she couldn't generalize. She was extremely concrete, or she is extremely concrete. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I know um, in, in the case of my children and, and many others, autism is predominantly a lack of symbolic thought, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and maybe that has roots in these microstructures in the mm -hmm. brain that are, um, they're, uh, abnormal from a construction point of view, abnormally constructive, and then they operate abnormally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I, I know that there's no unitary hypothesis of autism, but it, it seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and, and I will tell you one of the problems, and, and uh, I started by describing changes that were developmental in nature, is it, that they become cemented over time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I was living in uh, Louisville, uh, my, my kids were uh, very happy whenever it snowed because they would have a day free from school. Mm -hmm. But we used to live besides a golf course 
that had these little hills and they could go with their sleds. And, and you know, when, when you actually go to a fresh hill and you use your sled, you actually leave the trail markings, the, the, this um, uh, sort of wave uh, that you create within the snow. And, and uh, it's interesting, but once you keep going down the hill and using the same sort of path, mm -hmm. it actually becomes more and more difficult to go out of that path. Okay. And, and good and now I like the metaphor. <laughs> You're describing my son perfectly. <laughs> and, 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 and that's what happens in, in, in terms of um, some of the connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would like to tell you that uh, with, with many of my patients, um, and whenever I have gone around the world and, and visited schools and interviewed autistic individuals, I have uh, developed the habit of being a very good listener, okay? And, and, and it's because whenever I ask them about an experience, I cannot interrupt them. Okay, uh, what was the uh, last movie that you saw? They usually have an order and they will go through that orderly sequence of events, okay? And if you interrupt them, they will actually begin again at ground zero. Hmm. Um, that was the problem with, um, uh, what was the uh, uh, name of the uh, rain man the, uh, who, who died a few years ago? He, he had a, uh, yeah. um, he, he, he had a complete a genesis of the corpus okay. callosum. So, yeah, the corpus callosum, which is the structure that connects the two hemispheres. Um, yeah. I'm blanking on his name, but of course I know who he is. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting, but he used to have memory feats about um, reciting. Kim Peek? Kim Peek. Kim Peek. Okay. <laughs> it, was in, it was in a neuron. It was lodged deep in the neuron. <laughs> uh, reciting all of these books that he had uh, learned by memory. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, very interestingly, if, if you interrupted him, he would have to start from the very beginning. Mm. Wow. The recitation. Uh, you know, interestingly, and, and again, I'm not sure if you have any brain at any, any time, but a brain that is actually quite similar to Kim Peek is that of a dolphin. A okay. dolphin? Yeah. Mm. yeah. If, if you see a dolphin, they have a very large brain and they are very convoluted. But the main thing is that they do not have a corpus callosum Okay, because uh, they actually have two brains, the two lobes act independently. Mm -hmm. And that's wow. because they are mammals. And um, if, if they were to fall asleep and use at a very reduced capacity both sides of the brain, they would probably drown. Okay, so they need to keep one side active all of the time. Okay, interesting. When and, the other can shut off. And, 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 and in, in part, the, the brains of autistic individuals remind me a little bit of that because mm -hmm. they have a reduced corpus callosum, a complete agenesis. It's a predisposition. One third of uh, people with a complete agenesis, they have autistic traits. Mm -hmm. And they also have uh, many times seizures, the so-called Icardi syndrome. Uh, so there are many, many commonalities, and, and it's in the sense that you establish dominance for different parts of the brain, but you have less in terms of sharing information, long distance information among homologous areas of both hemispheres. Uh, finding Waldo, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, it should actually be very easy for an autistic individuals because they do it with one particular area of the brain, the occipital cortex. So they have good visual acuity. Uh, if you were to test them for higher cognitive functions, uh, that would entail using many different and, and, and uh, far away regions of the brain they would do badly, mm -hmm. okay? 
So, so there are some strengths and, and there are some weaknesses there in terms of uh, what connectivity dictates in the brains of autistic individuals. Yeah, I kind of back to your sled track analogy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, obviously one very marked symptom of autism is inflexibility of thought and inflexibility of behavior. Mm -hmm. and um sometimes this kind of micro savant ability where you mm -hmm. might have incredible ability and knowledge in a very narrow area mm -hmm. but you can't expand you know beyond mm -hmm. that and i think you know if if you were to really if you were to give a unitary theory <laughs> of mm -hmm. autism neurology mm -hmm. i think it would have to do with the florid connectivity that you see in a typically developing baby and adult mm -hmm. um, and the rapid connectivity you see in a developing child mm -hmm. compared to those sort of sled tracks mm -hmm. and those sort of narrow connectivity the inflexibility of connectivity you know in um in the autistic brain is mm -hmm. is that as close as you can get to describing, you know, what, you know, the pathology of autism, I mean, the, the root, the, the central core of the, of the syndrome? Yeah, I, I, I would say so. And, and uh, what is good about it is that you have both explanatory and predictive powers uh, with this sort of mechanism. Okay, you, you can explore different aspects of pathology and, and actually make predictions and, and engage future research that way. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that we used to do, at least in terms of my own research, uh, like um, uh, one of the things that we did when we created this uh, mechanistic hypothesis of what was wrong in the brains of autistic individuals was that I went around and I shopped for other conditions where the mm -hmm. neuropathology mm -hmm. was known, but maybe the patients weren't examined properly clinically for the presence of autism. You know, usually when somebody is born congenitally blind, you do not test them for autism, okay? Mm -hmm. Even though there's a higher um, significant probability of they developing autistic traits, it's just that one deficit overshadows the other one, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I created this uh, mechanistic hypothesis and I said, well, uh, how about people that have the same neuropathology, maybe not to the same degree of severity, uh, uh, people like uh, Ehrlich Danlos syndrome mm -hmm. uh, that have uh, heterotopias and deficits in migration. Mm -hmm. uh, heterotopia means that the neuron has stopped stop. migrating prematurely, yes. basically. Right, and, and, and I look for uh, women that abuse cocaine during gestation or they took lithium. And, and, and uh, I actually found that many of them, there were significant proportions of autistic traits in, in, the, uh, in the children of those individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it, it's something that can generate predictions and try to prove in an indirect mm -hmm. fashion uh, the validity of your model. Yeah. Well, you know, they say there's no biomarker for autism. Autism is completely defined by a set of behaviors. But well, um, ultimately, well, all of those are rooted, you know, it, biology is behavior, biology is the root of the behavior. Ultimately, these are rooted in mm -hmm. some abnormalities of the brain. But we, you can't get that because neuroimaging mm -hmm. is not precise enough really mm -hmm. to uh, to pinpoint these well, or to draw lines, right? Yeah, and, and, and the problem is that um, 
a neuroimaging will never match neuropathology in terms yeah. of level of resolution. But and we can't take biopsies of people's brains. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. And, and, and even if you have a series of cases, I mean, I had one story of TMS where we had 120 patients. TMS, uh, he's referring to trans... Cranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation, which will be the subject of our next episode. So go okay. ahead. So, so we had 120 something patients in, in one uh, clinical trial for uh, PMS. And in terms of uh, postmortem uh, studies, uh, we had to collect our own specimens initially. And our initial studies were like with nine patients and they came after uh, working on them like for two years, hmm. okay? Trying to collect samples and so forth. In, in 2007, I think I made a review of the autism tissue program and we probably had only like 30 something specimens hmm. in, in, in that collection. And, and, and I will tell you that one of the problems in terms of neuroscience, it is that anybody that has the money and the techniques available, they can generate results and have them published, but whether they are worthwhile, that's, that's another different issue. And, and a lot of the neuroscience uh, is plagued by um, research results that are really worthless or misleading. Mm. Controversy yeah. in autism, number yeah. one. Yeah. No, I, well, I, what what I, do you think? Give give. I mean, let, let's just put it on the table. What, give us an example of a a trope or an understanding um, from autism neuroscience that you think might be wrong or misleading. Okay. Um, okay. There, there are many, and and I will <laughs> tell you that there are series uh, starting with some of the first few papers in terms of neuropathology, where the results included samples uh, that should have never been included. There was one particular paper published, I think, in 1998 by a, a good friend and, and uh, somebody that I really like a lot. But otherwise, he included uh, uh, some samples um, uh, that actually made his brain weights appear to be macroencephalic, very, very large. Mm. And uh, at least three of them uh, were postmortem artifacts. They were caused by swelling after the brain had been removed. Uh -huh. and, and one of them, um, actually, even in terms of the examination, and they reported this, uh, it had softenings and it had a, a accumulation of bacteria uh, by microscopy, which um, uh, suggests putrefaction. Uh, that a specimen should have never, ever been included. Uh, there are other studies, um, uh, one of them uh, published in a very influential journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, that described patches of abnormality within the cerebral cortex. And um, they actually use very sophisticated method. They generated very fancy images that actually made the study very popular. And it has been cited uh, maybe over 700 times or so. And um, uh, that had been discussed by many neuropathologists because what they reported were artifacts. Uh, mm. And, and it's in the sense that people with autism and, and normotypical individuals, they don't die the same way, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, another example, Drowning. Uh, one, 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 one more prominent was um, uh, a study published in Annals of Neurology or Neurology uh, by a very good department. It just happens to be the department where I train <laughs> and, um, and, and a good friend of mine. And um, 
and and they publish um, a lot of inflammatory reactions in the brains of autistic individuals. Um, the only problem is that when you break the blind and you examine the autistic patients, many of them had seizures and they didn't account for the seizures. Oh. And many of them um, uh, died from near drowning mm -hmm. uh, and similar conditions uh, that, that provide for hypoxia reperfusion injury. Okay, uh, this is where you cut the circulation to the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a release of chemicals. Uh, you get inflammatory cells coming in mm. and they attack primarily those regions of the brains that have a lot of membranes like the white matter. And, and you could- So it was, the manner, it was the manner of death and not the autism itself that, that created the inflammation for condition. the findings. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of post-mortem studies, you know, I was part of the autism tissue program and the board and so forth. So mm -hmm. I, I was private to many of the correspondence that uh, was sent to them. And one of them came from a very distinguished lady in, in France, a very prominent autistic uh, researcher. And she said, well, thank you, but not thank you. <laughs> He didn't say that, but I, I mean, you could squeeze that email and you could actually have found blood <laughs> all over. And, and she said that after receiving the samples, you know, um, getting some of her uh, postdocs to work for them, you know, that that was going to be also like PhD project for this or that. Um, just at the very end of the study, after they did the autoradiography, they did some special staining and, and uh, quality assurance, and, and they found that the quality of the tissue was garbage. Mm. Okay, it couldn't be used for the particular technique that uh, they, they had uh, uh, used. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, this is something that should be known and then she finished her email by saying that many other people have received the same samples and have gone on to publish results that are utterly misleading within the literature. Because yeah. what they report is the manner in which the people died, the agonal and pre-agonal conditions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and not the core pathology of autism. Right, so everybody be skeptical of, uh, be skeptical of all research, read, read it critically and um, hear, uh, you know, know that um, post-mortem brain tissue, although it has provided the foundation for, I think, some of the most important research in autism, um, it can also be fraught with some complexities and flaws. So um, I, we're gonna have to end this episode here, but we're gonna come back, I think, um, with uh, two more episodes. So Dr. Casanova, stay on the line. <laughs> You're not going anywhere because we are going to do our next episode about controversies in autism. We just talked about one, but let's, and then our next one, we are going to talk about TMS. Um, so we will have three episodes with Dr. Casanova. Now, briefly, uh, this is his book, Defining Autism. Um, if you want to learn, really, I just have a great overview about issues in autism. Um, it's just, you know, we're, we're talking everything, history, diagnostics, um, therapies, uh, genetics, it's all, it's all in this little book. So I recommend that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Confidential. If you'd like to learn more, share an idea for an episode, or become a sponsor, please visit us at autismconfidential.org. The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual speakers. Content presented is for informational purposes only, and we do not provide any medical or legal advice.